much for the invitation. It's an exciting topic. Um, also, thank you for this nice introduction, myself, and for all your hospitality that has been part of this conference. Um, in comparison to the morning session, I will have a very practical kind of view, uh, starting with uh, general aspects of whistleblowing, elements, definition, but also the motivation of blowing the whistle and a characterization of whistleblowers. Then later on I will go to legal aspects uh, and afterwards to ethical aspects. So that's the part I want to go through. So quick circle around all the things. The legal aspect will be quite short because um, there is a lack of legal provisions, but a couple of questions that come out of these uh, subjects. Um, and I first wanted to ask you a question. I thought it's students in here, and usually I ask my students in the economic ethics class if they have heard the term uh, whistleblowing, but it's experts in here that I can skip the question. Why do I ask it? Because I want to know if this term is familiar. Because in Austria it is not really used in the media. There is no court decisions or anything like that. And if I ask my students, they hardly know it. But I will skip it because you have definitely know it. And we also know that corruption is present in our everyday lives. Um, Austria has its scandals. We talked about scandals yesterday. Right now, they are focused on the political level, combined with uh, parliaments, with lobbyism. We talked about it a little bit. But also, on the EU level, we can see it on Mr. Dali. Uh, rather more, I think it's very important to talk about that is this, this issue uh, to inform everyone and to get a little bit more of transparency into that process. When I started getting into the topic of whistleblowing, um, and I'm honest to you, I first had quite a negative um, feeling of it. What came to this impression? First of all, I thought it's sort of tackling peaching on someone. We know that from other situations, such as brothers and sisters running towards the mother, telling what he or she had done wrong. We also know it from pupils in comparison with teachers, going to the teacher, telling her someone has cheated, has smoked a cigarette without being allowed, and so on. Uh, we could also bring this process on the working place, but getting deeper into that uh, theme, into that focus, I found out that it has quite some positive impact. Um, getting a bit more of information out on a topic that usually is done in secrecy. That's a way to do so. Maybe my speech can also give an input into this direction, but we will find out later in the discussion. Um, the Austrian legal system can be compared with the roller coaster going up and down with provisions dealing with corruption. Uh, it was intensification on the one hand, a little bit later it was mitigation, and then once more making the law more strict again. Uh, corruption itself is quite a strong term. It's hard to give a precise definition. This is the one side and that's the border of it. It's hard to say. There are those gray areas. Um, you can also see it um, in Austria. The politicians, the parliaments didn't want to get uh, parts into legal provisions dealing with their own persons. Um, when it comes to provisions, uh, money they could get for not making law in their sense of way. So we have individual interests as well as the interests of states, as of politicians, but also of corporations. Uh, this way, corruption doesn't only harm each individual, but also society and the public city, the general public. And fighting corruption needs more than legal norms. They are necessary, but um, we have a global world and national as well as international legal norms describe a necessary framework. Nonetheless, in, an act, in a global acting wor world, we need more than that. And Leo Burkatsky uh, tell us what's the problem with legal norms. 
they point out four things that's characteristically um, for legal norms, it's time like abstraction, implementation, and rationality. Uh, making it a bit more precise, law is marked um, with a time like problem. We know the reality is always faster than the law comes up, it's always behind the real situation. That's the time like problem. Second, uh, we do have quite abstract, indefinite terms especially in this big complex when it comes to economic crimes and corruption. Um, and that causes less charges in economic offenses. Third, deals instead of verdicts um, are a result of these complex and long um, proceedings at court. Uh, this might lower uh, the reputation of the court and justice. And last but not least, uh, companies mainly focus on economic reasons, so you have to translate more aspects into the, their terms and language, into economic language. Nonetheless, ethical measures, and therefore I will focus on codes of ethics and whistleblowing provision, can, uh, cannot substitute legal provision, but can be a useful and sensible extension of that. Corporations, codes of conduct uh, implement standards for human behavior for its own uh, employees and I use this term in a quite narrow way uh, in the meaning that those codes are focused on their own employees. They are set up by the corporation itself or in combination with an institution outside but made by the corporation for the corporation and it should reflect their ethical standards. That's my understanding of codes of conduct. And the contact contents of these codes can vary. It can be labor standards and environmental stewardship, consumer production, Bribery, corruption, our topic, information disclosure, competition, taxation, and science technology. The scope is quite broad, and especially when it comes to regulations on corruption and bribery, you can either find that they want to prohibit bribery uh, in a very general way without meaning it so in a very superficial way. But it can also contain detailed um, whistleblowing provisions which we will focus later on. Or maybe explicit <coughs> elaborate standardizations and giving, receiving, demanding or soliciting gifts. So this can codes of conduct uh, from the language, the use of language itself can be quite superstitious or very detailed. The next step is the implementation of these codes. Whistleblowing, and I will we'll focus on that right now, as one possible tool for fighting corruption, and that's what it is in my sense, it's in becoming increasingly prevalent. It's becoming more important and necessary. <coughs> Therefore, it's worth having a closer look, and a very good com definition comes from Michelle and Nier. They define whistleblowing as the dis disclosure by organization members, these organization members, employees, former or current, uh, have found out illegal, immoral, or illegitimate practices under control of their corporations <coughs> and continuing their influence. And this disclosure, disclosure goes to persons or organizations that may be able to affect action, to do something about that wrongdoing. In other words, characteristic for whistleblowing is the fact that a former or current employee has information about organizational wrongdoing. That's the main impact. This information is in the area of responsibility of the organization. Illegitimate practices can't be finished by the whistleblower. He is not able to react in a proper way to do something against it. But he can pass this information and will force someone else to either act, <coughs> hopefully act, 
or sometimes not to act. So it should be set in further actions. Um, first of all, internal whistleblowing should be used, reporting the rumblings within the organization. Uh, why is it important for the organization itself? It's an um, early warning system. They could try to do whatever is necessary to stop that problem, to get a solution. Um, but um, this doesn't always happen. Internal whistleblowing could be a very positive sign for the corporation, but sometimes they don't. And it's a case that happened in Germany. A vegetarian, she found out that in meat from cows uh, contains unhealthy, dangerous things. She gave this information to uh, uh, public uh, officials and they did ignore it. And that happens a very often time with internal whistleblowing, the result is ignorance. She tried to give the information a second time, ignoring it was again the result and then she decided to go to the public because it was for the whole society uh, not wanting anyone to be killed or in a very bad condition. What happened? She got fired. Better results usually can be derived, and that's what also uh, part of it, that non-anonymous allegations are more taken seriously. Uh, but uh, instead of um, becoming a bad reward, retaliations, uh, anonymous um, whistleblowings uh, are easier for the one who blows the whistle. Why does it make a non-anonymous allegation be uh, better? Because there is a real person standing behind it and you can make your conclusion, can I trust this person, is it worth getting deeper into that topic to see uh, uh, is the accusation that has done right or wrong. Um, there is another definition, and I think it's too restrictive, uh, characterizes whistleblowing as a deliberate, non-obligatory act of disclosure uh, of non-trivial illegality to an external entity. I think it's in two ways too narrow, because uh, on the one hand we have also internal whistleblowing, and this definition is focusing on external entities. On the other, and that's what we also have to talk about, uh, is it really non-obligatory or is there an obligation standing behind possibility in the future? Um, coming back to external whistleblowing, if internal whistleblowing does not work out, it's the next step that can be set. And it means to pass the information on institutions and persons outside the corporation. That can be uh, the media, government agencies, consumer groups, or court. Austria is right now thinking uh, about creating an anonymous hotline at the ministry, but it's just and the process of considering to do so. And I don't have further information about it if it is only for the public sector or which doesn't really make sense for the private sector either. But to give you an impact, um, um, there's an investigation, there was an investigation of 33 legal cases and this investigation was made in the US concerning internal and external whistleblowing to have a look at it, what works out better. Uh, and these whistleblowers were wrongfully fired for reporting these wrong wrongdoings, a similar case as the one I just mentioned. Uh, and they found out quite interesting results. Um, employees who are relatively new to the organization, uh, they tend to blow um, external channels. It's quite obvious they don't really know the structures, the people, the positions in the organization and usually you don't really know who is also part of the whole process. So they tend to blow the whistle externally. Um, on the other hand, employees with a longer tenure and 
greater evidence of wrongdoing usually utilize ways of internal reporting. So they try to give the information uh, on intern uh, persons or organizations. Um, all the more internal whistleblowing is not as effective as external, having the organization more or less start with triggered investigation or remedial, remedial actions. They try to hope to cut the whole process down. That's just like very typically for Austria, trying to neglect everything, ignoring it, and maybe it will keep going further on. Uh, but also having a look at, at internal and external whistleblowing, different patterns of retaliation were found. More extent more extensive re retaliation such as mollification, isolation, and last but not least firing the whistleblower correspond with external whistleblowing. So we have seen quite some negative aspects about whistleblowing. What makes someone at all blow the whistle? And the motives for whistleblowing show a very broad variety. Uh, they can range from altruistic to egoistic moves. Um, if you have a very idealistic uh, person, employee, this person possesses very high idealistic standards and they try to bring their ideas on the same level to the corporation side. Frustration results when this mismatches the reality with the idealistic standards. What do they do? Um, in this way, sometimes they blow the whistle if there is problems with this discrepancy. Um, former employees who blow the whistle are either interested in informing and warning the public, like in our case with the vegetarian, uh, um, not vegetarian, <laughs> um, Veterinarian, sorry. <laughs> I can't be wrong. Both of them, yeah. Um, so, uh, former employees try to warn the public about uh, wrongdoings, or, and that's not really good, they try to seek revenge or unfair treatment during their occupation. So, this could be also quite a bit different. And furthermore, with a Blowing can be used as an instrument of self-defense, trying to prevent disciplinary measures or an upcoming dismissal. Very egoistic moves. So we have a big um, a variety of motives, and you can't say for which reason they blow the whistle. Nonetheless, I could also find characteristics for whistleblowers, giving us uh, details. Um, and what's a characteristic for such a person? And it's on the one hand a good job performance. They also tend to be highly uh, educated. They hold higher level or superior supervisory positions, are older, more experienced, and may have greater power to effect change. But uh, isn't that exactly the same description of a person compared with a corrupt perpetrator? Uh, if we have a look at the ACFE report, it's Asso Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. They examine um, on a sociological level how does a corrupt a perpetrator look like. Um, it's more or less exactly the same description. It seems like a paradox. The higher the position, owner or executive level, the older, the longer they work for the corporation, and the better they educated, the higher are the losses, and the more they tend to be corrupt, or, on the other hand, they may blow the whistle. So we can have both ways. Um, back to this. Um, not really easy, more or less unsatisfactory situation to whistleblowing. Um, a whistleblower has more or less three choices. Um, he can 
um, tape voice, he can make the change by blowing the whistle, or he can remain silent, not trying to get any change done. He's uh, ignoring it and doesn't want to have to deal with the problem. Or the third uh, thing is that he can exit the organization. He knows he can deal with it. Um, it's sort of not getting a change uh, either, ignoring the same text, but that's the third way. Um, once the whistle has been blown, two steps can be made from the point of a corporation. The management can either disregard the claim or it can take appropriate action. So we have two further upcoming results. Uh, the employee either does get rewarded in a positive sense or he does get retaliated in a negative sense of way. And definitely retaliatory measures shall undermine the complaints process. It should isolate this person, defame, disgrace the whistleblower to cut the whole thing down. Um, if you have a look at codes of conduct, they sometimes can include whistleblowing provisions, but it's not the common yet. Um, breaches of internal policies such as codes of conduct, external regulations, I'm talking of those caution for Einwohner and other regal -like regulations can be reported. But it needs more than developing good whistleblowing policies, the implementation itself, the monitoring of this process, and uh, therefore whistleblowing systems uh, can be important in the fundamental step. Let's have a look in Austria how is the actual situation here, and we have an investigation. It's a very new one from 2012, done by an office of attorneys at law, which was quite amazing that they do this kind of investigation. And they had a look uh, on the implementation of whistleblowing systems, those hotlines. Um, as I mentioned already, uh, Austria doesn't really have um, a frequently set of uh, whistleblowing systems. Nonetheless, they found 21 organizations having that sort of system out of 92 corporations. And they found a couple of interesting correlations which did not really, which were not that surprising to me. Um, these systems depend uh, on the size of the corporation, the bigger the corporation the enterprise is, uh, the more. Uh, a corporation tends to have this whistleblowing hotline. Uh, also another argument was if this corporation was listed at the stock exchange, combines also this element, and a third was listened the existence of ethic codes, which might stimulate whistleblowing hotlines. And they were also asked those corporations who did not have a whistleblowing hotline for the reasons, and as reasons for the lack of hot, hotlines were mentioned alternative solutions on the one hand for wrongdoings in every kind, such as intern compliance systems, intern guidelines, um, technical support also for controlling employees, appraisal interviews, a good working atmosphere. But also, it was mentioned, the corporation is too small. It doesn't make sense for that size of an enterprise. But even more, and that's uh, also uh, at the same level with my question I wanted to, step, to give out, it's the ignorance or the uselessness of such hotlines. They don't know what to do with it. It doesn't make sense to them, so they skip it. And interesting was, but not really surprisingly, the high amount of missing answers in combination with reasons for not implementing hotlines. Uh, reasons for implementing hotlines uh, were the protection of the organization's reputation, 
that can be a quite superstitious uh, kind of view. The disclosure of criminal actions, implementation, liability of superior guidelines, such, a, such as given guidelines from a trust, sometimes uh, an American trust, legal requirements, uh, such as the Sabans Act, which gives obligatory um, to implement uh, whistleblowing, or a measure, uh, as a measure of prevention. What can be reported in those hotlines? Um, it's very big, wrongdoing such as corruption, fraud, privacy of products, money laundering, minderings in accounting aspects or intern controlling systems. Displeasing behavior, we have everyday, uh, in other words, mobbing, or other criminal acts that can be brought in. Who is the recipient of those informations that do get into the hotline? Uh, in 12 cases out of 21 cases, it was a compliance officer who was responsible for this information, but also in-house legal departments, external attorneys at law, or external service provider who take care for this duty as a recipient. How is the ongoing process then? Um, in 11 cases, after having contacted the above authorities, the suspect gets informed. Uh, in two cases, we're still talking about those 21 cases, in two cases the suspect was informed immediately, right after the arrival of the information, and in two cases, which was really bad, the suspect was not informed at all. How can you blow the whistle? You can use phone, email, written messages, you use the internet facilities, uh, so you have couple of channels of information. Um, which one was used most couldn't be said because it was that big of variety. In 14 cases, the whistleblower stayed anonymous. Uh, in seven cases, uh, the identity of the whistleblower was exposed, but could have kept uh, anonymously in special occasions, but the special occasion didn't show up, so they brought it up, and which was really interesting was they also investigated if the hotline was abused, maybe for egoistic uh, motives, uh, and we have these 21 cases and in 11 cases uh, having used the hotline, disciplinary measures were set. Only in 10 cases nothing was done um, so it seems like it was the right call to use the system. And how often are hotlines used? Um, well, you might guess already it's not really that often. Um, 10 organizations out of 13 mentioned that they have less than 10 messages a year. There was that scope, less than 10, more than 10. So. Most of them mentioned less than 10 messages. Um, a postgraduate student of mine once told me his company also has a whistleblowing hotline. And this hotline hasn't been used in years, so I think that's the average, the most common way to have it, but it doesn't get used. So the key for a functioning, cordial and honest reporting system is to keep the benefits of whistleblowing as high and the harms as low as possible. But it's not so easy to be done. And there was a good a sentence about it. And I quote, in this sense, it is important to create an organizational culture that is conducive for whistleblowing in which bad news doesn't get you killed. It definitely needs trust and integrity of the superior to believe in that this might be of a positive impact, a sense of responsibility of the management when it comes to the modus operandi for the reported wrongdoing. How do they deal with this information? Do they ignore it or do they really uh, talk about it and try to get a solution? Uh, whistleblowing is more likely to be if efficacious when the recipient is responsive to it. 
one's quite logical. And the whole complex also needs additional support uh, through corporate guidelines as well as legal norms. Um, so I would like to have a short look on the legal provisions, the legal aspects, um, because they seem to be a very necessary framework that has to be set, at least in us, because we still don't have any provisions about the topic, um, primarily to protect the whistleblower against retaliatory measures, and we mentioned it already, um, financial cuts, mobbing, discrimination, dislocation, dismissal, but also, on the other hand, preventing the abuse of whistleblowing hotlines for egoistic moves. The Austrian legal system doesn't have an explicit norm right now, and so how do we deal with that kind of topic? We try to get an impact out of other norms, um, mostly labor law. And as part of the employer-employee relationship based on labor contract, each employee already has some sort of a duty to inform about negative aspects inside the working process, <clears throat> such as forbidden instructions or serious suspicious facts that harm the corporation. The higher the position, the more of information can and have to be passed on. This can be derived from the so-called fiduciary duty or the duty of good faith. But there is no such duty for a former employee. He doesn't work for the corporation anymore, so he doesn't have you can't argue with that um, part. And on the other hand, whistleblowing contains more information than the ones mentioned above. It does even get more complex when it comes to external whistleblowing. The reporting of wrongdoing can conflict with loyalty. The employee's duty of good faith so we have it also in the other direction, even more with provisions about confidentiality and secrecy. The higher the, uh, the position, the more evident it is that you also have a provision about secrecy and confidentiality. How about that aspect in combination with having to blow a whistle? So unsolved problems. Uh, it's upon the employee right now to weigh um, the pros and contras, reporting versus confidentiality. So it's standing alone and it needs legal support, therefore, to clear uh, the positions, also to give an impact what to do in those situations. So I cannot give you a correct answer because there is the lack of legal provisions in that case. Um, substantial information should be given through the whistleblowing hotline to a relevant person or institution and then it's up to the organization to set further actions. Whistleblowers do only possess parts of the whole information. He does never ever overlook the whole uh, process, who is involved. He only has parts of the information, so it's quite uh, hard to say he has all the proofs, he has the whole information, and he definitely has to use the whistleblowing hotline. Uh, how substantial is the information he has? That's not easy to be answered, but that's for sure. Whistleblowers always think about it very often before they take the step to blow the whistle. More lives have been talking about the duties of whistleblowing, but how about rights? Uh, does the whistleblower have a right on reporting anonymously? It's not answered yet. Different versions all over Europe. And uh, not to reveal the identity is seen as a key factor because it protects the whistleblower uh, on the one hand and it makes it more effective. Who needs to be informed? The superior? Is he involved? Do I know? Do I not know? Do I go an instant higher or do I? tend to uh, inform someone externally. Data protection is another keyword. How long is the information 
Does it have to be kept? Um, whom does it have to be passed on? Who is allowed to have insights uh, of these information? And on the other hand, we should not forget the rights of the suspicious person. Does he or she get informed about having blown the whistle? Um, is this person able to argue um, more questions than answers all the more? It should be closed by legal provisions uh, on the first step. So that's my part to the legal uh, aspect, and I want to have another short look on ethical case. In my opinion, there are three elements worth having a closer look. On the one hand, it's power and influence, and second, <coughs> responsibility and liability. Uh, first, um, I have a look to the term of power. The more power and influence a person has, the more this person can be corrupt on the one hand, or it may tend to blow the whistle, so it's both ways. In this context, the focus is based on codes of conduct dealing with um, corruption, as well in this case having those whistleblowing provisions. And French and Raven identified five bases of power, power and I want to concentrate on one of those five. Uh, it's reward power, coercive power, legitimate power, expert power, and reference power. And I will have a focus on the legitimate power. Because um, legitimate power is not only meant to be focused on internalized values, but also um, on the legitimacy of authority, um, in other words, the position of a person and the position of a person is relevant in various situations. And even more, and that's also in context with my paper, uh, generally accepted norms, such as legal norms or codes of conduct, that are accepted by the individual. Explicit instructions for actions, in other words, norms, can be the basis for legitimation. Besides legal rules, um, codes of conduct as a framework, uh, regulation, allegorized version of power and institutionalization. Puppets calls it institutional powers. It's out of the book, Phenomena uh, And this Institutionalization can be the basis for legitimation of corporations, managers, employees, but also uh, can be the basis for depersonalized power because there's not one specific uh, person mentioned, but the same of legal norms. Uh, it's um, on a general <coughs> abstract version and therefore depersonalized. Uh, managers can come and go, but the power that is set in the code of conduct uh, goes a longer way than the manager stays in the corporation. Poppets combines this institutionalized and formalized power with this depersonalization and comes to the conclusion that this uh, tends to become more steady and constant. Um, the conclusion with ethic codes and codes of conduct, um, power gets depersonalized and therefore more steady and uh, constant. The main goal of those codes is to influence the employee to behave in one way or not to behave in the other way. So it tells you what to do and what not to do. This brings me to the next term, responsibility. Who is responsible for what and to what extent? Orientation and guidance uh, for employees' regulation and controlling behavior is one of the main focuses of these codes. There are uh, lots of varieties of responsibility and I want to have a look on them uh, just uh, from a very short perspective. From a very general perspective, the term responsibility st stands for justifying, explaining oneself. 
you have done something and you have to give response, you have to justify your action. If you have a look at the terms, um, responsibility contains the term respond. It's the same in Austria, verantwortung, antwort, geben auf etwas. Um, so